Now, an emerging challenge, in my view, um, is the transformation of the countries of Central and Eastern Europe uh, from countries that are only sending people to being countries that are receiving people as well. Uh, and the big question uh, that I would raise, are the countries of Central and Eastern Europe ready to accept labor migrants, asylum seekers, and refugees? Thus far, especially in the Baltic states, we have only a handful um, of, of uh, both labor migrants and, and uh, asylum seekers and refugees. Uh, is there a debate on these issues in our countries? Is it a debate based on human rights? Or is it a debate dominated uh, by right-wing populists who are manipulating the issue? Uh, are we even discussing, are we preparing ourselves for this issue, or are we acting like this guy? <clears throat> My own view is that very often we have our heads in the sand. At least in Latvia, uh, no politician wants to even discuss this issue uh, because you cannot win any votes at all uh, by raising this issue in a rational way. Uh, that you can only lose votes because people think you discuss immigration, that means you want immigrants, you want to spend money on immigrants, uh, and that means we won't vote for you. Uh, but this is not a long-term solution. So we need to have a, a debate. We need to be very clear, clear-headed about what awaits us in the future and begin this discussion now. And I think it's uh, very important uh, for people engaged in the human rights movement uh, to be involved in this debate and not let it be monopolized uh, by people who want to spread uh, fear and, and anxiety uh, and prejudice. An emerging challenge that ECRI faces in many countries that it deals with are issues of immigrant integration. Now, in the Baltic states, we don't talk about immigrant integration too much because we don't have that many recent immigrants. We talk about the integration of society or the integration of non-Estonians or the integration of Russian speakers and so on. Uh, but we don't talk about immigrant integration. Elsewhere in Europe, this is one of the core political issues being debated. Now, ECRI, in its work, focuses on anti-discrimination as being a critical part of immigrant integration. We're very interested in the climate of opinion uh, surrounding integration issues, uh, and in particular, the issue of stigmatization, whether or not certain groups are highlighted as having a particular integration deficit, as not being fully prepared to integrate, as not wanting to integrate, as not being able to integrate. Sound familiar? <clears throat> and in our view, there's a worrying shift in the debate throughout Europe, uh, where initially people talked about the right to integrate or the need to integrate, and now they're talking about the duty to integrate or the obligation to integrate. And if you don't, do not fulfill your obligation or your duty, some countries want to impose punishment on those who are not willing to fulfill their duty uh, or obligation. And there we get into some very tricky human rights issues. Now, there are some challenges uh, that seem to be new, but they're really old. They've been around uh, a long time, uh, but they've gained new forms or they've gained new topicality because of various political or economic events in Europe. And one, of course, is the issue of the Roma. And of course, this is Europe's uh, most vulnerable pop population. Uh, we have very small Roma communities in this area of the world, uh, but I would submit to you that their problems do not differ so much from those of Roma elsewhere. Um, everywhere we see uh, what I think are still inadequate efforts towards promoting their social inclusion. Uh, I think what we will see in the next uh, five, 10 years uh, is regardless of the, the, in, the, the inadequacy of these efforts, we will see attacks, especially by right-wing <coughs> populist parties, on these programs as being a waste of money, as not having the impact that was expected or desired, uh, as the Roma not doing nearly enough for themselves to pull themselves up. Uh, so I have a feeling there will be a big and nasty debate about these Roma inclusion programs, uh, which, are, uh, which are quite extensive in many areas of Europe, but are still not having the impact we had hoped. Uh, Roma migration uh, within Europe is a very difficult issue. Uh, now, before uh, the, the countries of Central and Eastern Europe joined the EU, this is what the European Commission did. It talked, especially the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, not the Baltic states, they talked with us about Russian speakers, uh, but in the rest of Central and Eastern Europe, they tried to push through conditionality uh, an improvement in the situation of Roma, through anti-discrimination legislation, through government programs, and so on. And, and the underlying fear was if they do not deal with the Roma issue in their own countries, these Roma will come to us. And to a certain extent, this has happened. We see a significant Roma migration uh, from the countries of Central and Eastern Europe uh, to various countries in Western Europe. And recently, we saw uh, a very uh, high-level controversy in France uh, over Roma migrants being assisted to return to their countries of origin 
in Bulgaria, uh, primarily in Bulgaria and Romania. Um, uh, but uh, assisted return uh, is nothing new. It's been going on in France and a number of other countries for a number of years. Um, but one thing that really struck us this time around uh, was the high level uh, of, of stigmatization of the Roma community by the highest political elite in France. And this is something uh, that caught our attention and we recently adopted a statement expressing deep concern about this. The European Commission uh, did the same uh, and this issue was very much on everybody's agenda. Another new old challenge uh, is the issue of Muslims and Islam in Europe. Now, what's interesting is that Islamophobia uh, is a relatively recently recognized <laughs> phenomenon. It's probably been around in Europe for many years. But if you look, the first real study that used the term Islamophobia was put out in 1997 by the Runnymede Trust, which is a, an NGO think tank in, in, in Great Britain. Uh, so it's only uh, really been in the public eye for the last 13 years or so. Uh, and of course, uh, after uh, the attacks in 9-11 uh, and in Madrid, London, uh, and elsewhere, uh, the issue of uh, prejudice against Muslims came to a forefront in the context of counterterrorism. We've seen huge and highly divisive debates about the veil uh, in France and other countries. Uh, and of course, we saw uh, a strong undercurrent of prejudice in the debates about Turkish about possible Turkish accession to the European Union. And then, of course, uh, recently, about a year ago, we had the Swiss minarets controversy, uh, in which, uh, in a referendum, uh, the majority of citizens in Switzerland voted to ban the construction of minarets. Now, during that campaign, uh, there was a lot of uh, anti-Islamic prejudice that was voiced. Uh, this was a very popular campaign poster. As you can see, the minarets are portrayed as missiles. Uh, you have <clears throat> the woman in full headgear uh, looking menacingly, and everything is uh, going to bring Switzerland down. Various versions of this poster appeared throughout Europe after this controversy. Uh, this poster became quite possible, uh, quite, uh, quite popular, uh, and it had very wide echoes in the debates about, uh, about the place and situation of Muslims throughout Europe. Uh, and you have similar discussions about possibly banning uh, the construction of minarets in other countries as well. And we were quite concerned about this, um, and we, we made a strong declaration, uh, but the issue uh, persists. Um, if you're interested in this issue, there's an excellent new study out put out by the Open Society Institute called Muslims in Europe, uh, or At Home in Europe. Uh, it's a study based on very extensive research in 11 cities with significant Muslim populations in Europe. Um, and it, it has some very interesting data. It suggests that discrimination against Muslims displaying uh, visible signs of their identity, veils, headscarves, uh, uh, other, other attributes that, that could identify them as Muslims, that discrimination against these people is greater than that against immigrants in general. Uh, it also suggests that religion uh, can often be a source of social capital, uh, that it can support uh, participation of Muslims in, uh, in public and, and political life, and that it can promote their integration. It does not necessarily have to be a barrier. Uh, it also suggests that, that there's a strong desire on the part of these Muslims to interact. They do not want to remain separate in different communities, or at least the vast majority of them do not. And particularly, they want to avoid segregated schooling, because segregated schooling usually means unequal school. It means poor schooling. It means uh, that they are being excluded. A big challenge uh, that I think will continue to uh, face us throughout Europe is right-wing populist parties um, that, whose bread and butter issues are precisely these issues of, of racism and tolerance and so on. Uh, they've been in power now for a while. Uh, in government coalitions in Italy, in Switzerland. Uh, they are junior partners supporting the government in Denmark. Uh, recently, we've seen strong growth in such parties uh, in the Netherlands, in Hungary, in Austria, and just recently in Sweden. Um, and this is something, and these people, uh, these parties generally uh, often set the tone on issues related to minorities and immigration. An interesting thing, though, is that their success, it's not a unilinear march towards success for these parties. And sometimes they get into power, they make a mess of it, they show up, they have a lot of questions, but they have no answers. Uh, 
They're more corrupt than the people they claim are corrupt that they want to represent, and they lose power. The voters vote them out. And we saw this recently in Poland and Slovakia. And I think that these cases, or cases similar to these, uh, should be studied in great detail uh, because I think it will help us to identify uh, what is it that what is it that uh, could be effective in counteracting the impact of these populist parties? What kinds of issues need to be addressed uh, to undermine electoral support for them? Um, and and how, how it is that they develop? Uh, these right-wing populist parties often have very effective media strategies. They're often creations of the media. They're very expert at using media. And I would submit to you that the anti-racist movement, movement for equality, um, is still relatively backward in most areas of Europe. Uh, we are leaving the paper age, uh, the age of national radio and television, um, and we are not prepared, either conceptually or in terms of legislation, uh, to deal with cyber hate, to deal with hate on internet-based media, social networking sites. Recently, I did an experiment, and you can do this yourself. If you go on Facebook or YouTube, uh, do various kinds of search searches for racism, skinheads, skins, and you can find some very scary websites and some very scary networks that are openly operating on these social networking sites. On one I found on Facebook, uh, there were various, you could click under various headings, uh, join a group, engage in action, buy weapons. Uh, <clears throat> these groups are actively using social networking sites and the internet um, to recruit new members uh, and plan attacks uh, against various groups in society. And they're very good at using YouTube. You can find some very scary uh, videos on YouTube in which basically have glorification of violence against uh, immigrants and minorities of various kinds. And the big players, Facebook, YouTube, MySpace, uh, Google, have not been very willing to engage uh, in, a, in a dialogue with the anti-racist movement about dealing with these issues uh, on the internet. Uh, at a recent OSCE event on cybercrime and cyber hate, uh, none of the big players was present. And it's not because they weren't invited. Uh, they, have not, they have not, except in a few countries, in the Netherlands, for example, in Germany, uh, local NGOs have very good and constructive relations uh, with the internet industry. Uh, but this is, uh, but these are, uh, it, these are exceptions to the rule. In most areas of Europe, we do not have this kind of dialogue and effective cooperation. And this is something that we need to address. 